So we have, on our program this evening, we have Little Hard Knocks. So uh, um, Roxanne just spoke on that. We have a film called Heart um, uh, by uh, Sam Carney. We have Flat Rocks by Courtney Montour, and I believe Courtney's here as well this evening. Courtney, did you want to say a few words before your film? Fine. Okay. <laughs> um, we have uh, Bidaran, The Dawn Comes by Amanda Strong, and last but not least, Warrior Women. Uh, following the projection, uh, as I mentioned uh, when Roxanne was down here, we're gonna do a Q&A, so stick around for that. Um, think about your questions, start brewing. We, um, uh, I have a few questions usually to start off, and then I turn it over to you guys, so, uh, you know, it's the, do your homework, come on. Be engaged. Um, so, all that we have to say now is uh, enjoy yourselves, bonne projection, and uh, um, I, yeah, I hope you enjoy these films. I'm super excited to show them to you. So I'm going to invite our two filmmakers to come to the stage. So Courtney Montour is a Mohawk from Ganoake. She works in documentary film and digital media fields exploring issues of indigenous identity. Her first feature uh, documentary, Sex, Spirit, Strength in 2015 premiered on APN and won two awards at the Yorkton Film Festival, including Best of the Fest. She has also directed episodes for several documentary series, including Mohawk Ironworkers, uh, Working It Out Together, and Big Dream. She currently coordinates McGill University's Indigenous Field Studies course held in Ganawage. So, uh, if you, if Courtney wants to come down. Her, uh, we saw her film Flat Rocks uh, this evening. We are also very lucky to have Roxanne Whitebean with us who is an independent writer, director, producer from Mohawk Territory of Ganawage. In 2015, she won Best Drama Prize Pitch at the Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival and was selected by the Whistler Film Festival as Aboriginal Fellow for her short film, The Paradigm. Uh, Roxanne is an alumni of the 2016 Aboriginal Documentary Program with screen, uh, the National Screen Art Institute uh, she has directed a five-part series, Thunder Blanket, and one-off uh, series and shorts for CBC uh, Short Docs. So please welcome Roxanne. Thank you both so much for being here this evening. It, uh, it's really wonderful that we get to present your films. Um, just to start off, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a question sort of more general for the both of you about uh, why this, why did you choose the, the subject matter that you chose, you know, and in your case, you know, you're looking at sort of this incredible uh, young man who I think has a bright um, future ahead of him as an athlete, and, and for you, Courtney, also talking about the St. Lawrence Seaway in this part of history that gets not discussed at all. Um, about what happened when the seaway was built and the impact on um, the Mohawk community. Um, so well, how did those subject matters sort of come to the two of you? And, and I don't know who would like to start. All right. Um, well, thank you for having us this evening. Um, so for Flat Rocks, uh, Roxanne was actually the producer on that. Um, we did that project together through uh, the National Screen Institute, uh, which is in Winnipeg. So if anybody has any real vested interest in making film, TV, or whatnot, uh, they have tons of programming to, to work with. Um, so our short doc grew out of there, and um, we wanted to do something on our community. And it took us a little while to decide exactly what that was going to be. Um, and we ended up coming to the St. Lawrence Seaway because it's something that we, as a community, see every day, um, that many people don't actually know the effects, the impact, the reality that these ships pass literally right here. Um, and there's a lot of trauma in our community still existing from this. And it's the first time um, 
for a community that a film has ever been made. There's been testimonials videotaped, but it's the first time there's been a documentary. So that was really why we set out to do it. Um, and what has happened since, I think, has been really important for the community uh, in terms of community screenings that we've had, um, the discussions that the community has had after. Um, our Mohawk Council of Kahnawake uses it um, all the time for different meetings they have with different levels of government. Um, so it's become a tool for them. Uh, we're hoping to get it into the uh, educational system in Kahnawake. Um, and again, it's really just been circulating in these kind of discussion forums. And I think it's just important for people to see that uh, it's played internationally and that you know these issues are still ongoing. And you got to see that in warrior women as well. I think we see uh, you know, amazing women doing many things, but you see these issues still repeating themselves and they're still here today. Absolutely, it's, it's history that it just cycles, you know, where, where we, you know, I think what the Wasoaset First Nation is experiencing is very comparable in a lot of ways, you know, it's, so I, I feel like as much as it's a, a documentary about a past event, I feel like it's so incredibly relevant to all these conversations that we are having today about territory, about land. Um, and for you, Roxanne, uh, what, uh, how did you meet uh, your young star? How, how did that process come about? Um, are, you, are you a boxing fan to begin with, or? <laughs> um, well, before we, oh. I see Sam, sorry. You might so, sorry about that. Um, before we move on to Little Hard Knocks, I'd just like to add about Flat Rocks. I think it's really important to, especially when you're a filmmaker, an artist, or whatever you have to, you should create work that you're compassionate about. And especially if you start to begin a platform, it's really important to use that to help your people in any way that you can. And the majority of my work, because I have a body of work, is um, focuses on language revitalization. I have another film, Gertie Winordu, Precious Things. And Flat Rocks was something uh, that was really important to me. So I was, I was really happy to um, collaborate with Courtney on it and act as the producer and co-writer and all of that stuff. And it was just, it's, um, we've really shared uh, the experiences of, of our community because the film has traveled all over the place. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been doing really well and I'm glad that people finally um, are hearing our stories firsthand from us. So for Little Hard Knocks, I, I know Satagayun Tagwa because he's from Kahnawake and I know his family and everything. And I decided, you know, if I'm going to create work, I want to experience like different genres and I want to, you know, experiment, but also because he was doing really well and I think it's important to support our young people and give them visibility in the media. And um, I would just, um, can we give a round, round of applause to Tugar? <laughs> um, he was such a pleasure to work with. And uh, no, I wasn't really a boxing fan. I was just like, okay, this child is doing really good and, and I want to learn everything mm -hmm. about boxing. So uh, they were very accommodating and friendly and everywhere we went, Saratoga and beating, uh, meeting, beating, <laughs> meeting <laughs> Bob Miller. Uh, that was so amazing and really great. And, um, and I only learned once the documentary was done and we were out in public spaces that he was shy because he was so uh, <laughs> wonderful, you know, like to work with and easygoing. And he really worked hard. I mean, yeah. look at the montage of him oh, training. Yeah. I was, that was done in one day. Yeah, that was well, mostly done in one day. He just fought all day and trained all day long. <laughs> and just even, you know, the shot of him when he's walking and he's got this huge bag of equipment and it's bigger <laughs> than he is and he's just like going along, you know. Um, I think he's such a, a very charming um, subject and, and it, I, not knowing anything about boxing either, immediately was like, I have to find out what all this is and like... Um, well, I, I'll tell you, it was incredibly difficult to fight, to um, film his scene, or his, his scene, to film his fight in Saratoga because, I mean, how long are your boxing matches? A minute? 
three one-minute rounds. Oh That's all we had. So I was like, okay, this is what's going to happen. And we so were fast. not allowed in the ring because it's a live fight. And so literally when he was doing those little scenes um, before the fight took place and we were kind of like doing 360s and stuff, we were laying on our bellies on the floor like the crew, like as soon as the camera would turn in our direction, we'd have to lay down. So it was really well coordinated and um, I had two camera <laughs> operators. So yeah, I, I don't know, it was just um, really good medicine to work with him. So I want to say thank you to the family, to Satagayun Tagwa and Gayate Noru his mother, like, thank you so much because um, it was a nice break from all the other content that I usually cover. Mm -hmm. And I think you bring up an interesting point as well because oftentimes um, the images that we see of indigenous youth are, tend to be so negative, uh, you know, unfortunately. and. Um, it's, it's really nice to be able to present like a counter to that because I know in my work, you know, working in the Cree Nation, you know, with young people, like, those kids are magic. Like, our youth are gonna carry us beyond, I think, even where some of us imagine, us, you know, things existing today. And uh, yeah, it was a, it's a really beautiful story. Um, so the way that our, our Q&A is gonna work is we have a couple of folks who are gonna circulate with microphones. So if you have a question, raise your hand nice and high, uh, and we'll come and find you. Uh, and if you don't have questions, I'm going to continue to, to ask my questions. <laughs> so is there anybody who has a question? Maybe one thing I could just quickly add, we're uh, still currently looking for a distributor. Um, it's still kind of doing some festival run. Um, so it will primarily be through a, a distributor that specializes in educational distribution. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything else you want to add about that. Yeah, and also, I mean, at, at some point, uh, the National Film Board also has an online um, database of films, and it will eventually be on there to stream as well for free. Yeah, thank you. So there's a few questions in there. <laughs> I'll try to. Um, so I think one of the reasons it hasn't been filmed before, um, again, indigenous cinema is just really having this opportunity to grow now. Uh, in our community, like Tracy Deer is probably the first filmmaker, I'd say. Um, and she's been making films, I don't know, maybe a little over. 15 years now, so there's not that many filmmakers in our community that are actually producing work now that's going out there in the world. Um, we have a lot of youth who are starting to make films as well, so I, that's just one thing that the time, the cost, uh, the support for someone to be able to do this work is just happening now. And like Roxanne said, uh, that's something that we both do, take that initiative to you know, just assist anybody else, any other youth who kind of want to do that as well. So that's one reason why it hasn't happened yet. Um, something like that would not, you were asking if that kind of land grab would happen today in Kahnawake, certainly not. Um, <laughs> I mean, a lot of things have happened since then and, you know, with the Oka crisis and the community has always been one that has really stood up. Um, but there's been a lot of things over the years there's, it would, that have affected our community, uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway, um, the railway, uh, hydro, the Mercier Bridge, the Quebec Bridge disaster. <laughs> the Quebec, yeah, <laughs> the Quebec Bridge disaster. But I mean, there's so many. But but that's yeah, that's further. But the things that really entrench right within the community. I mean, it's just never ending, right? So. The, the St. Lawrence Seaway was just another thing that just came through the community and everyone always thinks of putting this on indigenous land, you know, that it's, they can just, the government can do what they want. And um, in our community as well, people did not receive the same amount of compensation as non-indigenous people uh, when the St. Lawrence Seaway came in. There were whole communities that were relocated, um, non-indigenous, but for indigenous communities, it was very different. So they were kind of forced out, 
legal documents came after the fact. Um, so there was a lot of, yeah, undermining, underhanded work going on. <laughs> and, and this narrative that we see in your film about it, uh, about how it's sort of like, oh, well, the, the native people are inconveniencing the rest of us, you know, that's still a narrative that exists within our news cycle today, I, you know, where it's sort of, uh, I think the government likes to take this very antagonistic sort of standpoint of like, oh, well, you're the ones causing the problem instead of being able to sort of, you know, look at it from the perspective of the community, you know, of uh, indigenous people in Canada, you know, occupy less than 1% uh, of the, the land. Think about what that means, like, you know, so all of a sudden you're already on a very concentrated parcel of land that you've been given, and then to have a huge portion of it shaved off, like, I think that that's what's striking looking at the old pictures compared with like what we know the landscape is today and it's like oh my god they really just like took chunk a huge chunk off the community um so i don't mean to jump in on that but i just in terms of like i think this is i i don't think it would happen in the same way like you're saying today but i i think that it is still happening just in other ways well uh in our community the most recent uh, thing that happened was the um, expansion of the Highway 30, the construction of Highway 30. So they expropriated tons of land. And um, have we, have they made a deal? Because there, there was an agreement that was in place and basically I, I was never for it because it was just an exchange of our land for our land. Like, oh, we're gonna give you this, but it's already ours. So we were like, okay. But then the neighboring town of Shattagui, um uh, filed an injunction in the courts and they were trying to stop it because they said that they weren't consulted and that they wanted the land for businesses and whatever. So H Highway 30, when was that? I think it was in 2008, 2007. So it's like, it's very, very recent. And, yeah. and it's really frustrating when people tell us, you know, get over that, get over the past. All of that stuff happened a long time ago and you're standing there thinking, no, this is, this is still happening. The past is now. Yeah, yeah. it's now, it's happening now. And also um, the seaway directly uh, severed our connection to the water and our fishing and our mm -hmm. skills, our diet, our traditional diet. Um, just the people swimming, the way the people gathered at the river. They used to swim and have barbecues. And so now uh, it had a really huge impact because also our longhouse was destroyed. And so the longhouse people were displaced and there was a huge amount of stuff that, you know, followed uh, just those, those basic things, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I, have, I have a little bit of a question for both of you, uh, but if there are other questions, we will... Okay, go right here. Okay. Um, well, usually I build a connection with the family, and I normally ask for that after the video, like after I've already, I have my rough cut and I know exactly what I want and where that would be a great addition in the film. And um, I just work really hard to uh, create the best piece possible possible that the family would be proud of and whatever. And, and it's usually, it works out really well that way. And I guess, so you're speaking about possibly photos or their footage and or even, I guess, when it comes to filming with someone, I spend as much time as possible with those individuals, even people who are, are you know, loaning me their, their photos and their personal items for, for a film. So it's always about building those relationships, spending as much time with them as possible beforehand, um, and letting them see the film before it's completely finished. Um, because again, it's, it's, it's their life, it's their story, and they're the one who's gonna have to live with this forever, so I think they deserve to, to have a say in all of this before it goes out into the world. I was gonna say, um, both amazing points, because it is, it's so important, I think sometimes we forget, um, in f because you know, you're, you're writing grants and you're applying to things and you're trying to figure out, you're like, okay, well if I finish it by this date, I can submit to this festival and all those other little bits of production that you know, go into making a film. It can be so easy to forget that human side and how important it is to have that you know, when you're developing a story. Um, because yeah, you, you want people to, uh, especially when you're talking about 
collective history or collective trauma, you want people to be able to be proud of that, you know, at the end of the day. Are there any other questions that we're coming to? I'm seeing a couple of hands. Um, yeah, so I mean, this, this, the whole Seaway story needs a feature length documentary at some point, for sure. <laughs> Somebody needs to cover that. I mean, our whole goal was, with this was to tell the story through, you know, this one man's experience, Louis Daibo, and he's somebody who I hadn't, I hadn't heard of his particular story before, so it was a nice way to wrap it all up, but I came through so much documentation, um, and there were, were diff differing opinions, and different people in the band council had different ideas of, of what they should be doing. Um, so of course, it wasn't just all everyone stood together. But then again, you know, there, there's poverty. Um, a lot of people in our community, even the people who didn't want this to happen, uh, then had jobs working to remove, you know, all the trees and all the, the rubble. I mean, people need jobs. They need to live. So I'm sure that kind of, you know, thought process was part of the disagreements that went on. And also for us, we, um, we were able to interview a lot of people who experienced it firsthand who were alive, mm -hmm. like our grandparents and people. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a really, um, it was quite the experience. Um, before we let you guys go, I wanted to say a huge thank you um, from the bottom of my heart for being here this evening, for presenting us, or, or allowing us to present um, your beautiful films, for speaking about your experience and your community, um, and if we can get one last round of applause for our filmmakers. And so if people, if people want to find out more about you or what's coming up next, where can they do that? Um, for me, I have a, a page on Facebook that I haven't really been updating lately, but a lot of the links to my films are on there, and it's called uh, Roxanne White Bean Films. And um, a lot of my language documentaries and stuff are on there. Amazing. And I'm super terrible and uh, <laughs> don't have a page, but you can just follow me on Instagram or Facebook. And uh, my next project is uh, a short doc on Mary 2X Early, who uh, was an amazing woman who created change in the Indian Act with gender discrimination. Mm -hmm. And I'm also doing a feature doc on Team Indigenous uh, Roller Derby. Amazing. <laughs>